This is by follower request. How do you go about reading a scholarly article? And disclaimer, I am not an academic. I am not a researcher. I am not a statistician. I am not a self-proclaimed EMS professor, but I am an avid consumer of research and publish scholarly articles. In a five minute social media video, I am not going to be able to teach you grad school research methods or statistical analysis. But for a little introduction, here's what I do when I read an academic paper. First, what is the point of the paper? What is the question the author is seeking to answer? Or is it a case report where the author learned something new or had an unusual learning experience and wanted to disseminate it in a journal? Does the point of the paper make sense or is it just one of those thousands upon thousands of crap articles that get published each year just so that somebody can get something published? And does the problem being analyzed in the paper correlate with the information you are seeking to gather? There are plenty of examples of published papers being improperly used to push an agenda, and the authors have said, that was not the intention of the paper that we published. We looked at a specific problem, and someone is misattributing what we found and published to their own agenda, and it may not align. And you have to be very alert for bias. Watch my video on MPDS and how the founder and proprietor, Dr. Jeff Clawson, has published article after article after article in reputable academic journals to promote his for-profit business priority dispatch systems under the guise of academic integrity. Clearly bias. But bias can also be personal and not something that involves a financial interest. For example, there is a particular physician out there who has a vendetta against paramedics intubating. And he has published paper after paper after paper about problems associated with paramedic intubation and how amazing supraglottic airways are. Clearly, this guy has an agenda, and you have to consider that bias when reading his stuff. Now, I am not saying to just disregard a paper if there is a potential for bias. No, bias is inherent. It's always going to be a factor. For example, the inventor of a product is going to be biased in his, her, or they, them's product. Or someone with a true passion for a particular area or a strong belief in something is going to have bias. It's human nature. And when you read these papers, you can't just say, yep, no bias, disregard it, unless it's very blatant bias. And personally, I think the financial bias is worse than personal bias, but that's just my opinion. But what to do about bias, you should be mindful of it. You should keep it in the back of your head when reading research or academic academic papers and consider that when you critically appraise them. And bias is one of the big reasons why they publish their research methods in academic papers. Ethical researchers and authors are essentially saying, hey, yeah, we know that bias is a risk in all research. It's a human factor. Here is our research methods to show how we went to conduct a study in a sterile way possible to eliminate any bias that we had as researchers. Other things to consider, and again, I am not teaching you STAT and Research 101. Remember, I have said many times in college and grad school, I did enough in STAT and Research just to get by. Things to consider. Was the study size small or was it large? If it's larger, the results are going to be more generalizable to the total population. For example, if you were looking at stroke risk factors and your sample size was 10, then that's going to be less valid and generalizable than it was if the sample size was 10,000. Also, who was being studied? Take paramedic intubation as an example. If the study shows that paramedics suck at intubating, did the study factor multiple systems? Was it systems that had robust QA and training programs? Did it have an involved medical director? Did they do specific airway training? Or was it fire-based EMS systems where they have paramedic firefighters on engines who are the type that forget that you have to check vital signs after you give someone ketamine for excited delirium? Or was it only flight teams in the study? Because certainly that may skew the stats the other way due to experience and training. Do the researchers use convenient sampling, which is exactly what it sounds like? A couple of years ago, I did a little study of my own looking at first pass success rates in pre-hospital intubation. I looked at my department. It was right there. It was convenient for me. I didn't have to do any extra work to get the data. I had easy access to all of it. 
Again, was my study rendered useless or not valuable by this? No, but it does take away from the generalizability and it is another factor of many to consider. Also, what approach were the authors using to look at the question or the problem? The gold standard, I think you know, is a double-blinded prospective randomized control trial, but there are certainly other methods and they are valuable for getting information out there. There's meta-analysis, where they take past studies and past trials and they kind of meld them together and extrapolate insights on the problem from those combination of studies. Was it retrospective, meaning that they went back and they looked at past data? Was it a survey? Was it simply a case report or a literature review? Again, things to consider. You also want to look at the statistics. I would be bullshitting the F out of you if I told you that I remember from grad school all of the chi-square, regression analysis, box plots, blah, blah, blah. But things to consider and the things that I look at, remember this is what I look at, I'm not saying I'm right or that you should look at me as some stat role model because I'm not, but here's what I look at. Sample size, we talked about sample size. I look at the p-value, and that is the probability that what the researchers found is not due to chance. You want it to be smaller, and p is less than p being less than 0.03 tends to be the standard. That means that there is a 3% chance that what the researchers found could be due to chance, meaning that there is a 97% probability that the data is valid and not due to random probability. I look at confidence intervals. Boiled down to dummy terms, if we tested the same question with a different sample population, what are the chances that we would get the same findings? 95% confidence interval tends to be standard, and it conveys that you can be 95% sure that you have a true mean of the population. Also, look at the odds ratio. That is the chance that the outcome is due to exposure versus the odds of the same thing happening without exposure to something. Again, let's use the easy paramedic intubation study example. You could say the paramedic intubation is bad because nine out of 10 patients in the study died after a paramedic intubated them. However, what were the odds that the patient was going to die without a paramedic intubating them? If they were all hypotensive multi-system trauma patients with CNS involvement, then the odds ratio would not be good for the assertion that paramedic intubation is associated with more death in those patients. And by looking at those four things as a novice reader, a me, I think you can get a decent insight into the stats. As long as you know that there are people out there that are smarter than you and know this stat thing backwards and forwards. And then simply read the results of the study. Look at the results for yourself, both the raw numbers and the discussion, the numbers and how they extrapolated the data and how they interpret the data. But don't just take their word for it. I'm not saying disregard them or not be respectful. No, but trust but verify. And this is why you can't just read an abstract or why you can't just jump to the conclusion in a paper. I have found, and the more I read research and the more I become literate in it, the more I find that the author may free text in the conclusion and may not totally jive with what the data shows. Again, realizing that I am just a paramedic and I am not an academic, but you can't bullshit a bullshitter. For example, and I'm just throwing numbers out here hypothetically, these are not from any particular study, and I am just doing this to highlight my point. Say you're looking at the pre-hospital use of supraglottic airways versus endotracheal intubation, and the conclusion of the article says that there was significantly better neurologic outcomes when supraglottic airways were used versus pre-hospital endotracheal intubation. Then that's what the head... So the knee jerk head nod, retweet, med Twitter crowd is going to go, oh, boom, there it is, retweet it, and that is what they're going to get from the paper, and that's what they're going to repeat, and what that is what they're going to implement in their own practice and in their agencies, and that is not good, because you have to go back and look at the data and the research methods. So if you go back at this paramedic intubation, supraglottic airway thing, and you look at the research methods, you look at the data, the meat and potatoes of what's not in the abstract, uh, you go rather balls deep into the article, you will see that significantly better outcomes, significantly better neurologic outcomes was 15% in the endotracheal intubation group versus 17% in the supraglottic airway group. 
And you have to rightly ask, is a 2% difference in the chance that the patient is going to spend the rest of their life drinking their meals out of a straw, really, while on paper and statistically, maybe statistically significant, is that really significant? And this is where the real world collides with the research world. EBM is critical. We need things to be based on evidence, not on anecdote. We know that that is not good. We know this by now. That's the way we've always done things argument is good and easy for people like volunteer firefighters, but not for professionals with integrity and standards like us. Evidence-based medicine. However, you can't just live in a research bubble. You have to remember that the real world exists as a crucible to see if the research and the data survives the test. And that, friends, is a basic, and I mean basic, approach to reading an academic paper.